How is everybody? Great. Good. Good to see you. Good to see you, Isaac. It's glad to be here again. Yep. Always happy to be here. Let's give folks another minute or two. Shall we? Mm -hmm. All set. Yeah. All right. Well, I just um, I'll I'll do what I've done before and say um, my name's Isaac. Um, I work in the reference department at the New Haven Free Public Library, and um, to everyone who's here, I just want to welcome you on behalf of the library to uh, the talk tonight. Is called "What We Still Get Wrong About 9/11" uh, with Professors Matthew Jacobson and Zarina Gruwal. Um, part of the ongoing Democracy in America at the New Haven Free Public Library series. Um, I wanna also let you know, we have a copy at the library of uh, Professor Gual's book, Islam is a Foreign Country, American Muslims and the Global Crisis of Authority. So please place a hold if you're interested um, and place a hold for any of our other books. We're doing curbside pickup for books. And of course, um, thank you so much to everyone who put this talk together. Um, Karen Rothman and Amy DePoy um, for all their work on the series. And of course, um, to you, Professor Jacobson, for hosting and shepherding us through these talks. They are great to listen to. So um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody. It's uh, great to be here once again at, at, in the virtual New Haven Free Public Library. Uh, vaccine on the way. We look forward to being in the same room with each other once again. Um, thanks to our, our partners at the New Haven Free Public Library. This is a partnership that's meant a lot to us uh, in the last several years, um, and we're always pleased to be, to be working together. Um, thanks to, I'll, I'll join Isaac in thanking Karen Rothman and Amy DePoy, who have been working uh, on this event and who are currently working behind the scenes. Um, let me just uh, make a couple notes about up upcoming events. This is our last, uh, our last event before the holidays. We'll be back in January and we have a, a, a full calendar uh, next semester. Uh, we start off in January with Paul Sabin talking on the politics of climate and the environment. Uh, and then on through the semester, we have the noted historian David Rodiger on race and democracy, our colleague Phil Goff on policing. Joan Cavanaugh will be here to talk about her new book on the Winchester factory here in New Haven. Uh, Chatra Ramalingam will be talking on the decolonization of the museum. Uh, our, our friend and uh, colleague Khalil Johnson, who teaches up the road at Wesleyan, will be speaking on education and domestic imperialism. Uh, and we have a few further surprises still in the works. Um, so keep your eye on both the, the New Haven Free Public Library and the Public Humanities websites, and uh, the full winter spring calendar will be posted very soon. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, Zarina Graywall. Uh, Zarina took her PhD at the University of Michigan and she currently teaches in the American Studies, Religious Studies and Ethnicity, Race and Migration programs uh, here at Yale. She's a historical anthropologist and a documentary filmmaker. Her research focuses on race, gender, religion, nationalism and transnationalism across a wide spectrum of American Muslim communities. Her first book, as Isaac mentioned, Islam is a Foreign Country, American Muslims and the Global Crisis of Authority, is an ethnography of transnational Muslim networks uh, that link uh, US mosques to Islamic movements in the post-colonial Middle East through debates about reform uh, of Islam. Her first film, By the Dawn's Early Light, Chris Jackson's Journey to Islam, examines the racialization of Islam and the scrutiny of American Muslims' patriotism long before 
9-11. And I want to put in a plug for this film. Uh, Chris Jackson, who later became known as Mah uh, Mahmoud Raouf, was Colin Kaepernick before Colin Kaepernick was Colin Kaepernick. And he is a beautiful, charismatic person. And this is a beautiful film. Um, the, by the dawn's early light, uh, please make the time to find it and, and watch it. Serena's so forthcoming book, um, Is the Quran a Good Book? traces the place of the Islamic scripture in uh, the American imagination, particularly in relation to national debates about tolerance. She has received awards for her writing and research uh, from the Fulbright, Weiner, Gren, and Luce Foundations. Uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome Serena Graywall. Oh, thank you so much, Matt. Always great to be here. And thanks to Karen and Isaac and everyone that put this together. Um, it's great to be kind of energized by this after a very long, hard semester. So thank you all. It's great to have you here. Um, so I, I thought, you know, when you first invited me, Matt, um, I, I was thinking, oh, I'll have lots to say. I should do something on the election. And I'll have lots to say because I've actually been a fellow with PRI. So I've been like tracking, you know, all the horse races and all, all that all for the last year. And then it occurred to me that, that by this time in December, everybody would probably be sick of election analysis. And so for those of you that are sick of election talk, I just, I just want you to know, don't worry, you're about to get sick of 9-11 talk because we're coming on, uh, believe it or not, I know time is very confusing right now. We're coming into 2021, which is the 20 year anniversary of 9-11. So for somebody like me who re does research on uh, American Muslims and US Middle East relations and the history, uh, uh, you know, I've been actually invited by a number of producers, documentary filmmakers, radio people, um, journalists and others to consult or be interviewed as an expert or to do fact checking on all of this programming that's about to come um, uh, in the next year uh, as we commemorate the the uh, 20 year anniversary of 9-11. And um, spoiler alert, most of it is terrible. <laughs> and so I thought I would um, take this opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the the I mean, I have to say it's a bit deflating because it makes me feel like the work that people like Matt and me and others have been doing for 20 years uh, talking about, you know, the, 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 the limiting uh, frameworks for how we think about 9-11 and the kind of uh, what my friend Melanie McAllister calls uh, Americans determined incomprehension <laughs> uh, about um, the, you know, U.S. and the world and, and American history, um, all how, how sort of stubbornly resistant those are to being chipped away at. Um, and, and then at the, at the same time as an anthropologist, I'm also just interested in the affective dimensions of this, like what, what is a memorial, um, you know, what's the function of it, what's a good one, what's a bad one, you know, what, what, how, how do people who care about creating public facing work, um, you know, uh, how, how do they get through the puzzle of both wanting to entertain in some ways, but also educate an audience, if that is in fact uh, uh, the premise of sort of infotainment. Um, but also when you we're talking about something as, as, as serious as September 11th, you know, um, and memorializing it. I mean, memorials do two things, right? So they're they're trying to take you back to that moment. I mean, the, the challenge of a memorial, um, like a ritual, is the problem of repetition. That like, will the sensory be dulled by repetition? And so I thought I would begin today um, by sharing a short film, which probably some of you have already seen, but I hope that not all of you have. Um, so in 2000. One, a French producer named uh, Alan Brigand had this idea on how to commemorate the first anniversary of 9-11. And so um, with Sean Penn, basically they invited 11 uh, filmmakers from around the world to make short films. Um, and they invited sort of like very, you know, well, re renowned filmmakers uh, to make 11 short films um, that the, and the only the only directions were that the film had to be uh, 11 minutes, nine seconds and, and one frame, because, of course, in France, it's 11, nine, one, not nine, 11, uh, one. So um, so that was the idea. And so it's this incredible collection called September 11th. And um, and sort of the clim climax, so you watch the films together and the kind of climax of the collection is the film that I want to show you today, which is by Alejandro uh, Inaratu, who I'm sure you know from, you know, he's an um, award-winning filmmaker. You probably know his other work. Um, I'm hoping some of you will at least be new to this. And actually, I have to say that I have taught this film. So it, the films all came out on the first in 2002 on the first anniversary of 9-11, a couple of days before the first um, anniversary of 9-11. And I have taught this film collection in 
a couple of classes every year in the last 20 years. And that's how compelling I find it. Um, and this is my, I'll just say, um, one of my favorite documentary films, although as I'm going to share with you, I have some ambivalence about it. So I'm going to try to share my screen now, probably after doing this all semester, I should be really good at this. And, um, and it just, there we go. Okay, so hopefully you are all looking at what I'm looking at, which is a black screen. So I just want to say one quick thing about this. This is an experimental film, so a lot of it is black and audio. He's trying to break up um, the, the, the two tracks of visual and audio, and it's, it's supposed to be 11 minutes of visual silence. And so if you're seeing a black screen, that's on purpose. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that, and you'll see the film is mostly what we might call found sound. So I'll begin now. Oh, and can I also just say, please feel free to leave your comments in the chat because I'll be reading along with you to hear what you think of it. Uh oh. What happened? <gasps> okay. Um, aborted or the media? What is going on? It worked. We just tried it like 10 minutes ago and it was working fine. So let's see. I can try this again. I wonder if we can. Sorry about this. Uh, okay. Okay.
the World Trade Center. We have something that has happened here. Flame and an awful lot of smoke from one of the towers. Whatever I will has tell you from the size of the gash, the, the wingtip had to be at least 150 to 200 feet wide. Oh, my God. Oh, the next building there's just another one. Up. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Another oh, plane hit. just flew in. The, the explosion is incredible. Another oh plane, God, as we were watching. The World Trade the Center have been hit by aircraft of both are in flames. E andiamo proprio in Medio Oriente perché nella notte i carri armati israeliani sono entrati a Gerico, dunque la tensione è molto alta. People jumping out of windows. I've seen at least 14 people jumping out of windows. People jumping out. People just kept jumping and jumping and jumping. And you could still see they were alive because they were flailing around. People on the street where I was standing, we saw the first person jump from the building. Everybody was jumping. It was crazy. Jill, it's a fire. I love you. I love you. Tell everyone I love you. I don't know if I'm going to be okay, girl. I love you so much. Michelle? Michelle? How are you guys doing? How are you guys doing? Michael, little girl. Hi, are you there? Back. Pick up, sweetie. Okay, well, I just wanted to tell you I love you. We're having a little problem on the plane. I just love you more than anything. Just know that. It's a little problem, so I, I just love you. Please tell my family I love them, too. Bye, honey.
So um, I have to say that every time I watch it, it is, um, it, it, it moves me um, so much. And uh, sorry, can you still hear it? Let me make sure it's, is that still, yeah, let me, uh, sorry, Explosion is the next film. Um, I have to say every time I, I every time it is um, it's powerful for me and I especially that moment of course, the visual imagery, but also Max's mom, who keeps her voice so steady when she says, I love you, and there's a little problem on the plane. And I just think that that's just such an um, extraordinary moment and extraordinary courage. And that that's just, it, you know, the, the, those, those um, voicemail messages juxtaposed with the visual that we see of um, the photographs that become, that are later uh, become iconic, but also become taboo. Um, one in particular came to be called the Falling Man um, photograph. Uh, the, the television studios pretty quickly decided that they were not going to, to show those images. Um, but in the New York Times the following day, there was a photograph of a man falling and kind of bisecting the two towers. Uh, and then there was a lot of backlash to that. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm um, I'm just, I'm just, I, I'm always just sort of in awe of just the power of the documentary film to use those, the juxtaposition of that audio track and even the black being kind of the plane looking at the tarmac or something. Um, and those, those um, audio fragments and putting them, putting them together. I'm, and I'm, I don't know if people have put anything in the chat or not about just their own responses or Matt, if you have a thought about it. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's incredibly powerful and it's, um, you know, I've often felt that the as much as we as much as we glorify what what a camera can do, it's actually the audio track that's the most powerful. And I think that this little this film is proof of that. It's just it it, it couldn't be more powerful. Yeah. And it it is the, actually the darkness and the sound that makes it so powerful. It's just, but I'm I want to just go back because I think I share some of your ambivalence about it. And I wonder if it's in the same terms or not. But um, I mean, there are a couple of things I want to say about it. I mean, I was in New York that day and I lost friends that day. And it's just um, so an evocative document like this just hits me in a, a, a certain way. Mm -hmm. But as an as but as a, you know, a documentary practitioner, as a scholar, as a historian, I mean, one of my ambivalences has to do with um, I guess kind of where you started, the idea of memorial on the one hand and Melanie's great phrase, determined in comprehension on the other. And, and I think I could argue this film either way. And I, I wonder kind of how you think about that. Yeah, so for me, my ambivalence is um, really about the way the film ends in in posing these questions about religion and narrating it as as you know what does it mean to end it in arabic um saying does god's light guide us or blind us so that tells you something about who the director assumes is the primary audience for that message is arabic speakers um and then we get a translation um and and I, you know the people who did the subtitles did not specify and i don't think the director was connected to that but the 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 the, uh, the foreign the foreign language you hear to, uh, is actually indigenous um in, in, indig indigenous people praying uh, for the dead that's part of the audio track that, that he's using there um um and so that juxtaposition for me creates the good religion bad religion or that religion is the primary cause or mystery or, uh, or, or problem here um, you know the question that we've been debating for 20 years well, more than 20 years but especially in these last 20 years is is religious violence special so for me right away that question is like the wrong question because well so the, the simple answer is no um, because religious violence is political violence and so it's not special or different from other forms of political violence and part of for me part of what terrorism the category of terrorism does is uh, allows the state precisely to not name political violence as political violence and call it something else terrorism right so exactly that the the, the moves that are happening 
in that. And so then how do we get out of this trap of talking about um, religious violence or jihad? Uh, and, and that's not to say that I don't think that there's a you know, I'm obviously a religious studies person, so I, I care about uh, thinking about religion in a critical way and, and thinking about all the good and bad things that happen in the name of religion, but also happen in the name of nation states. And that's what the war on terror is about, right? But, 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 but what we have in our mainstream media representations, whether it's the September 11th or whether it's, um, you know, cartoons of Muhammad or whatever, is that these conflicts are represented as A, a clash of civilizations, um, B, as spontaneous conflicts. They're uh, without history. Um, there's no way you can understand them. And they are, and that's sort of that idea of just these two planes flying out of nowhere into New York. Uh, and so for me, what I hope we can do today is just talk a little bit about what it means to, like, what's the kind of metric by which we know if something is actually um, a kind of serious meditation on September 11th. And to me, if it doesn't account for the history, uh, and I'm, by the history, I mean the Cold War history that led, that brought us to September 11th, you're in trouble. Uh, and, and, um, and so, you know, and of course, we have Mahmoud Mamdani and others who've written so eloquently about, you know, the ways in which Islam got essentialized and treated as the kind of total explanation in Edward Said's sense um, for everything that happened on 9-11 and since, and that, you know, that this, this is what we need to be able to break out of. And I guess I maybe naively thought that 20 years later, there would actually be the space to have a kind of critical engagement about what happened that day and what brought us, what, 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 what that event, the longer history of that event. And, um, you know, my, my, um, frustration, disappointment, anger, is that we're actually rehearsing the exact same script. So, you know, when, when George Bush said, oh, you know, they hate us because they hate our freedoms. I mean, bin Laden had an answer to that. And his answer, because he was sending us tapes, and a uh, book I recommend to everybody is Bruce Lawrence's Messages to the World, which is just the audio transcripts of bin Laden's tapes and messages to us Americans and to the world about what his problems were. So he actually has really rationally, he's quite articulate and uh, about what was motivating him. Um, and for example, a lot of those messages are about a little, you know, a conflict of Palestine and Israel. Um, it's not about our freedoms. And, and Bin Laden actually responded and said, well, why didn't I hit Sweden then if the issue is the freedoms, right? And that is the question that I think we're still not ready or willing to hear is that what what is what was it about the u.s in other words the u.s american empire that was the part of the equation um that you know explains so much of this and so um you know that that's I, I feel like the question at the end you know you have this incredibly complex documentary film we're thinking about you know these people who are forced i mean part of what i think one of the reasons those those um, images were suppressed or seen as inappropriate is also I've had students and maybe I don't know if people were thinking about this in the in the today's uh, our group today, but for some of my students they'll say things like you know it's like they committed did they commit suicide is it like because the, the people that jumped out of the World Trade Center are too close to the suicide bombers or they've been pushed to this like put in a corner and their de the desperation um, although I don't know that if you're you know. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that suicide, jumping out of the World Trade Center in that context, but there's something about that idea um, for some people that it's like it, bring, it makes the victims and the perpetrators, brings them too close together, and I think Amitav Kumar and others have written about that I, I, idea as well. Um, and so we might think about, you know, why that image is so, so difficult to see, even though it's not graphic or bloody or, or um, you know, but it's just such a, so horrific, so horrifying. Uh, and it's again the ways in which the the black is used, the, you know, the, the audio. Um, and I also, of course, I have to think about it also in terms of the, you know, until 2009, which the suppression of images of of the uh, soldiers' coffins coming with the flags draped over them from the war. Um, and so my hope today is that we can just think a little bit about like what are the kinds of critical questions that we have to bring to anything that we consume related to the commemoration of 9-11 that's going to happen in the next year. Um, I think uh, if we can go now, Karen, to, I was going to say a little bit about, I would, maybe I won't sh 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 do the whole thing because we're running low on, lower on time and I wanted to sh have most of it for discussion, but Karen, if you'll just play, I've been an expert for uh, sort of a consult, doing a consultation with NPR um, 
on something called Blind Spot, the road to 9-11 for NPR. Uh, and this was, you know, um, I thought going, it was not going to be, it was inspired by the original documentary, but they were going to kind of update it and have it be more politically attuned to, to how people are thinking now. This is what I was promised. And um, I was so disturbed by the, with the direction of this eight hours of, of radio documentary that I actually pulled my name out of the project <laughs> because for me, it was basically copaganda. So we'll just play a little bit of this so you get a taste of what, um, what NPR has produced to commemorate 9-11. Blind Spot: The Road to 9/11 is brought to you in part by the History Channel. There's nothing special about my 9/11 story. Like everyone's story, it depends on chance. By chance, that morning, I was living in a house on a hill at the tip of Staten Island when I heard about the first plane hitting the North Tower. I rushed to the hill, where there's this perfect view of the World Trade Center. I remember standing there and suddenly feeling the second plane flying past me. It was a jumbo jet and was coming in loud and low. The plane ripped past and went streaking over the water. Um, I don't know if we're losing the, the audio, but maybe I'll go Karen is I'm sorting it, I'll just say a little bit. So the big picture, I mean, even from the title Blind Spot, you can see that the overall narrative frame here is that 9-11 is a tragedy that could have been avoided if it weren't for a series of law enforcement or intelligence um, bungled errors. Uh, and these are the blind spots. So I, first of all, hate this framing because I, while I do think 9-11 could have been prevented, again, I think it has something to do with the Cold War and not with just, you know, a couple of mistakes. And so basically the way this eight hours works is it's these stories where it's like, oh, oh, look at how this one, um, you know, shooter was mistaken by the NYPD as a lone shooter when he was really, the, it was the beginning of Al-Qaeda, and that itself is a very problematic account of that particular um, case. And so it tries, so it tries, to, it tries to give a history of 9-11 um, from the perspective of law enforcement, uh, but it's not based on what, like, scholarly consensus. It's based on, really, the speculations of FBI agents and, and um and NYPD. And so you have, you know, you're going to spend eight hours, and, it, and by the way, the storytelling is really quite compelling, and, the, you know, each episode is about something that went wrong, like, oh, here's a falcon hunt, and if only we had dropped a bomb on it, we would have would, would have been able to prevent 9-11. So instead of kind of having the angle of, like, oh, isn't it funny that there used to be a time when the U.S. thought about whether it should drop a bomb on a country that it was not at, at war with? <laughs> That's not the narrative. The narrative is like, oops, whoops, this was this was wrong. Or the, the narrative is, you know, they're all the, the main characters are, as I said, police or FBI agents. Uh, the only Arab or Muslim sidekicks are, you know, uh, informants or, you know, the son of um, someone who's inspired by Osama bin Laden who regrets that. Uh, it, it goes on and on. So because you're not able to hear the clip, I wanted to go, go into too many details, but I just want to say one thing about it, which is that, you know, consider that this is being made in the, in the same moment that someone like AOC in New York is saying that, like, let's defund a, you know, Department of Homeland Security and ICE, and we're watching, you know, the Kenosha Police Department burn to the ground, and you have all of this, you know, eight hour episodes in which it's basically a kind of, you know, a love story to the NYPD and FBI agents. Matt, you look like you were going to ask me something. No, well, a really important question just came in on the chat. It's about oh, okay. kind of backfilling the Cold War history that helps us understand this, because I think that um, it's it, the question itself um, speaks to the power of the ideological work that the kind of mainstream discussion has done, which means like 9-11 like can be the beginning of a story, but it can't be the end of one, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, nobody except professional historians really know the kind of the prehistory of 9-11. So can you right. just kind of walk us between, between kind of the Reagan administration's arming of the Mujahideen in the 1980s up to, can you get us there? Yeah. So, you know, um, so, I mean, I, 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 will, I will do a really crude couple sentences version, but I'll definitely recommend some books that I think everyone should read. So I already mentioned this. Uh, Mahmoud Amdani's Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, and I'll put this in the, in the chat in a moment, is a man, he was a journalist before he became an academic. There's almost no jargon in that book. And that book 
alone. You could just take even one chapter of it, the Afghanistan chapter, and that you'll in you know 30 pages you have a very succinct, clear, and I think fair history that leads us to 9-11. But, but really what it is about is the idea that there are proxy wars. So the, the, the Cold War was about the USSR and the US fighting it out in third world battlefields. And this happened not, uh, it happened first in Latin America and in Africa and then in the Middle East. So maybe the story of the prehistory of 9-11 is the Latin Americanization of the Middle East from a US policy point of view, okay? And so how does Afghanistan become, um, you know, this theater for the US and the USSR to fight it out? Uh, what's extraordinary about this eight episodes is that although it claims to be a global, global history of 9-11, um, there's only one episode that even takes place place outside of the US, which is in the Philippines. So this means that they completely gloss over the Persian Gulf War, which, you know, Osama bin Laden had some thoughts about um, uh, that the Israel and Palestine is totally absent, which of course was the primary obsession of bin Laden um, before it turned into, you know, the story turned to about the US uh, military footprint within Saudi Arabia. Uh, all of that is, is, is missing. And then of course, Afghanistan itself, you know, becomes um, with the help of the CIA, top opium producer of the world. I mean, you have a complete destruction of that society. Uh, and of course the Mujahideen go there, but the way that and it's narrated in, in, this, in this series is that, oh, you know, Charlie Wilson and Ronald Reagan are not very discerning about making Muslim friends and they met the wrong guys and oops, here we are, 9-11, you know, uh, or they befriended the wrong people. We're making deals, you know, we got in bed with the wrong people. And it is, uh, it is, it is so frustrating that 20 years later, we still cannot get past this. These were, these were not mistakes. This was a policy. I mean, the Iran-Iraq war, for example, you know, the idea was, I mean, Kissinger said very clearly, let them kill each other. So we're playing both sides in all of these proxy wars uh, and wreaking havoc all over the world. And that then culminates in events like September 11th and other events like it. Right. So is and that yeah. a good, is that a good yeah. three minute no, version of the, if, yeah. If, <laughs> okay. if, if you're going to do it in two minutes, that was, a, that was an excellent two minutes. Um, okay. but one of the things that's, there are a couple of things that are so striking about this. One, one is that, yes, those Bin Laden tapes, I remember um, while Bush was talking, and Bush and, and Pipes and all these people, um, Bernard Lewis were talking about Islam, um, Bin Laden was talking about political economy. Yes. And, but you, if, you, if you said that out loud in the United mm -hmm. States in 2001 to 2007, eight, yep. like it was taboo, it was absolutely, you could not suggest that it was, that it was, um, that it was anything but religious irrationality. Like you could not, you, know, you could not, you could, you would be, you would be tarred and feathered. Yeah. And, and even, even, you know, I mean, one of my big fights with, with NPR and with also with some of the other groups, the other documentary PBS and other groups that I'm working with is on the translation of what I would call non-believers to infidels. So everything's about the infidels. Oh, Bin Laden's upset about the infidels. The infidels are in Saudi Arabia. So first of all, I don't think infidels is the right word because the word that Bin Laden uses is not a, is not a slur in the way that infidels exactly is. Um, but the real issue is about what is the American presence in, in Saudi Arabia mean? I mean, you know, if, if I want to build, if somebody wants to build a Starbucks, uh, like in the middle of the New Haven green, it's never going to happen because the green, keep preserving the beauty of the green or whatever is important or like, you know, Central Park. I mean, there's, there's, we, we have this idea that there's certain sacred spaces that should be kept pristine and beautiful. Well, let me tell you about the most holy site in the world for Muslims, which is the Kaaba, where I swear to God, you could buy a Big Mac and throw it at the Kaaba from that's how close Burger King and McDonald's and Starbucks and everything is. It's right encroached right onto the, 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 the holy shrine. So it's that, it's the, it's the capitalist footprint of the U.S. It's the, it's the military footprint of the U.S. And it's these very real and very live um, political issues. So in one of the episodes, they talk about how, you know, wasn't it weird how Bin Laden, instead of liking hip hop or pop music, he wanted to sing like, you know, religious songs about Palestine. And, and that is as ridiculous as, I don't know, a, uh, you know, a black teenager today listening to rap about political police violence. I mean, it is, it is a completely natural, there's nothing, they, they want to paint him like he was this religious weirdo, but that's actually not the story. The story is not that Bin Laden fit the profile and no one caught it. The story is that Bin Laden was actually, you know, um, 
by the way, he was also a, a, a crazy Whitney Houston fan, and I know Daphne's here, so, you know, just, <laughs> I have to say, he was obsessed with Whitney Houston, so he actually, wa he did love Western music, too, um, but that doesn't fit their narrative, and so it's amazing the way the editing uh, happens in these shows to create what we think we already know, which is that Bin Laden was pathologically and excessively Muslim, and that's what drove it, and there's no way to f really fix it, and there was no way to prevent it, except if only we had known who they really were. But, you know, this is, this is just a constant problem, and, um, and so I have to say I'm just really concerned that we're going to be you know, pr consuming collectively all of this media in the next year that just pretends to give us a history, pretends to give us a context, but where we actually learn nothing. I mean, I, I, as a documentary filmmaker myself, I get infotainment. You've got to have some entertainment value for people to keep coming back for more. And this program in NPR does do a great job of like kind of twinning. So like there's like a story about the Rockefeller family that's like the Bin Laden family, or they do these little things. I get that. But there's actually no info in the infotainment. Like you leave this after eight, eight hours and you have learned nothing except that you know, we have culture, their culture has them, as Mamdani puts it in good Muslim, bad Muslim, or that, you know, that, that's, that, that they're just sort of held to these, um, you know, arcane and ancient books and rules and ways of thinking, and then it is a clash of civilizations. So again, I just say like one takeaway that I hope everyone can uh, have tonight is that if what you're listening to or watching about 9-11 in the next year doesn't trouble the category of civilization, you're, you're wasting, I mean, I think you're wasting your time. You know, you're just, you're just participating in essentially a kind of nationalist propaganda. Yeah. Two, two points of reference for, mm -hmm. for most Americans, I think. Um, most Americans who are consuming, you know, public discourse in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one is um, white nationalist terrorism, you know, from the, mm -hmm. really from the 80s onward to 70s, from 70s to today. Mm -hmm. That's one, that's one touch point. Another, I think, a really telling one is Irish terrorism uh, beginning mm -hmm. in the trouble, you know. So mm -hmm. if, if there's a Middle Eastern terrorist, people like Bernard Lewis want to run back to the, you know, to the, the clerics in the 8th century to, to yes. figure out what's happening. Um, whereas, you know, if the Irish blow up, a, you know, a baby stroller in the middle of London, nobody's talking about Catholicism. Nobody's right. looking at nobody looking at religious texts to understand that act. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, I mean, some of, the, some of the work that is done by the public discourse that you're describing, on the one side, it's a, it's a really um, elaborate effort to create and always reproduce American innocence. That's one of the things that's happening. But mm -hmm. on the other side of the equation, there is this I mean, it goes back to determined and comprehension. It's this, it's this exercise in, in absolutely rendering Middle Eastern culture in general and terrorism in specific as, as being kind of beyond comprehension. Yeah. Um, and, and terrorist acts on the part of people who are not Middle Eastern um, as not terrorism, actually. Yes, yes, that's great. So first of all, I was a, uh, I, I went to a Catholic schools girl, a Catholic Catholic girl school uh, after getting into trouble in my public high school. I was a very rebellious teenager. And guess what I discovered in this Catholic girl school is that they were, they were all sending money to the IRA and very openly and the bumper stickers and everybody was all about, you know, uh, supporting the IRA. And, and it was a point of pride uh, for these Irish Catholics in the Detroit area. And this is like, you know, roots too. I mean, Matt's book it talks about this ethnic revival and the ways in which everyone's connecting in that post-civil rights movement. The white ethnics are all connecting to their global roots. And you know what's happening at, at, uh, just around the same time or shortly after? Uh, Daryl Lee's excellent new book. Um, uh, it talks about how, uh, you know, all around the world, Muslims are gathering uh, to fight and to fight alongside Bosnian Muslims in solidarity with Bosnian Muslims, including American Muslims. So here's a funny moment where American Muslims are going to fight some for in jihads, but on the same side as the U.S. military, right? Uh, and that's another, I think, I mean, that's, someone has got to do that story. Uh, my first book is not about jihadists, but um, that certainly was on, on my mind. So that's the context in which I'm kind of coming to this moment. I don't know, Karen, if you can pull up those PowerPoint, um, that PowerPoint image for me. One of the funny things, so when I, when I tell, if I tell mine, I 9-11 story. So first of all, I walked into, a, I was in um, 
Chicago, this was probably on September uh, 12th. I was in downtown Chicago, went into what was Bart Borders bookstore, giant bookstore, um, and I went in, I just wanted to see what was on the shelf. Go just to the, ne the next slide, please. Uh, because one of the things that you had uh, uh, happen if you just go to the, yeah, that's, that, that's the one. If you, if you, one of the things that happened after 9-11 is the Quran became a bestseller. And this is what my next book is about. Um, basically, everybody had the impulse that if we're going to understand this, we don't need to go to the Cold War. We need to, go, we need to find the verse that made this happen. This is an incredible, um, um, uh, you know, our, our artwork by Munir Fatmi called Save Manhattan, where you see the, the World Trade Center in the shadow there with the Quran. And so they could not keep uh, the Quran on bookshelves. And when I went into Borders and I asked, I, want, I just said, where is the Islam section? And without missing a beat, the employee said, oh, the, uh, the, the terrorism section's right there. <laughs> and so it was like right that in that moment, I was like, oh, wow. And the day before, I had been in Dearborn, Michigan um, on 9-11, and I went, you know, was driving through like a, a predominantly Yemeni neighborhood, and there were these Muslim women, burqa clad, whatever, scraping something off the back of their cars. I didn't, I was like, what's going on? All these moms, all these Arab Muslim moms were out scraping off the I Heart Islam bumper stickers off of their cars. And for me, it was just like such a poignant moment of like, I don't know what could be more American than I Heart something or other on your car. Like, I just think bumper stickers are just such an American thing of like, in your face, what, you know, whatever. Uh, and so it was just this kind of moment where I was like, wow, what, what's happening? Like, it's all happening so fast. Uh, but what, what is it that makes that desire to read the Quran? Um, I, you know, it became a kind of form of political uh, witnessing after 9-11 and, and, and to this day. And it's also a kind of racial alibi and a deflection of um, accusations of bigotry in the same way of the invocation of the, you know, black friend. I have a black friend in the sense the same, it's the same kind of racial move where you can sort of say, oh, I've read the Quran and therefore I can say either Islam is good or Islam is bad. And you don't have to actually talk to any real Muslims or have anything to, or, or know anything about any of what's happened, right? Um, and so that's part of what I want to think about. That's what that installation for me is, is so important. Now, on the thing about white terrorists, so you mentioned my documentary film. The end of that film ends with the KKK uh, attempting to burn, allegedly attempting to burn down Mahmoud Abdurraouf's home. And in 2004, when that film came out, I ended by calling the people calling them terrorists, calling these white supremacists terrorists. And that was a very controversial a difficult thing to do in 2004 and in in that period like you were saying it was just kind of a taboo and terrorism was just seen as absolutely equivalent to islam and in fact oftentimes when we hear people talk about the problem with religion what they really mean is the problem with islam um and so here we so i fought very hard there and in, in policy circles to move the needle on thinking more expansively about the category of terrorism and i now look at that as like a giant waste of my time because uh, although now we can call white supremacists terrorists too that actually does nothing to dislodge uh you know the carceral policies of the u.s state and other states both within the u.s and and and, and around the world so um you know terrorists too or like white guys are terrorists too is just not it's just not the answer the answer is how do we really think about the u.s empire um and you know and, and all the things that be, that that 9 11 became an alibi for you know how that is what we should spend the next year thinking about is like how has this country and our world dramatically changed like what did how, what did 9 11 get used for and i think that is the most is the right way to commemorate um that, that day and that event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to, we have a few minutes left. I really, I want to come back to the documentary because it's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing source, but it, I, I agree with, it's a troubling one. Um, and not just the, in the ways that it's intentionally troubling, but it's, it's troubling in some ways that are probably unintentional as well. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that as, as powerful as it is um, and just profoundly moving, it also does commit some of the sins that you're describing of, of the kind of ahistoricism of more public kind of vernacular discourse. Like there's nothing you can learn about the history really from that particular commemoration. Um, so can you talk about like, in what way does it work for you as a commemoration given how harshly critical you are of some of the moves that it's obviously making. 
Yeah, I mean, the way it, it works for me and why I find it so compelling is that um, I think the truth is, is that it, it, it properly represents and captures the fact that most Americans don't actually know much about what is done in their name around the world. And so the shock, the violence, the the terror that they feel as you know, individual passengers in the plane um, and their desire to reach out to their loved ones. I mean, that is just so powerful and compelling. And um, I mean, that if, if there is a working definition of terrorism, and I agree with Daryl Lee that we should just like dump that term. I don't think there's any way to recuperate the category of terrorism. But if, I mean, part of what it's about to me is this notion that there are no, you know, these are, there's no rules of engagement in military conflict anymore, right? So there are no, there's no innocent bystanders. Anybody can be a victim. Anyone can be a target um, in, for, from, 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 in this kind of political violence. And that's, of course, terrifying, right? Um, uh, and, and, and so that's where it works for me because I think it, it does capture it captures that terror and it also captures the surprise, but I just wish it ended in a way which it was it could t where it could say, or where the film could direct us to say, but, but we shouldn't have been surprised. And why, what, what did it take to produce that shock, right, that day? Um, what is it, what is it, you know, it like, uh, I mean, I don't know, um, Morrison has a quote about like, uh, you know, what it, what it takes to not look at something, right, um, uh, you know, um, I guess because Daphne's here, I keep thinking of Tony Morrison, but, but, but you know, I mean, then I, they, I do like, how did, what is it? There's a lot of, it takes a lot of work to not see it, right? And so, because the film deals so, so well with the absence, the visual absence, the audio absences, to also be able to account for that historical absence, that's where my um, mm -hmm. frustration, frustration with it is, but, but. I don't know. I find it really affecting. And the fact that it can make me, like it can make the hairs on my arm stand up every time or make me tear up um, every time. I think that's what a, a memorial like should do at an affective mm -hmm. level. But can it be, can it, can it do something more than that? Right. Right. There's another question here, and this is worth mm -hmm. returning to. It's an, uh, uh, I can't, I don't know if you can see the chat, um, yeah. but it's, it's asking you to um, elaborate on, on what you said about using 9-11 as an alibi. Um, can you yeah. say more about that concept? Right. Um, so, you know, if we think about, um, I mean, we can, we can actually go back further before 9-11 to the Oklahoma City bombing. So what happened after the Oklahoma City bombing? That also became a state alibi for a whole range of things. Sorry, my this is, um, my mom is calling me on my computer right this second, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so um, at least my kids didn't bust through the door. But um, what was I saying about, uh, yeah. So I mean, what, ha what happened is you have the ramping up of policing. Um, I mean, we, we look, uh, and, and that affects primarily, doesn't primarily affect Muslims necessarily. I mean, Muslims are the kind of the canary in the mind, so to speak, right? And that, you know, what happens is the, 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 the state, um, implements all of these carceral policies that increasingly surveil and incarcerate um, vulnerable populations of black and brown people and people who are, um, you know, uh, economically disadvantaged in all kinds of ways. And, though, and, and, and that affects everybody, but Muslims are the alibi. I mean, the, 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 this is the, um, and it becomes unquestioned. So that's what I meant when I was saying, like one of the Unpair episodes is actually this weird twisting justification for torture, which, you know, it was just right as the torture report came out this year. And it was, I was just shocked. It's like, you really don't have to make the case for torture. We, I mean, the evidence is really clear. The torture didn't work. And why did the U.S., you know, pursue these policies, um, it didn't have to be this way. And, and so that's what I mean is that if we can just have the, you know, if we can just critically consume this material on 9-11 and ask, is it asking us to think about who we are and what we've become uh, and what the world, how the world has changed in anything more than a, can you believe they did this to us register? Mm. With just um, now two or three minutes to spare, can I, here's a, something I really wrestle with because uh, events have just so overtaken. I mean, this has been a really lousy millennium. Can I just say, <laughs> I mean, starting starting with the 2000 election and like everything that has happened. I mean, it's just, it's been extraordinary. So much has happened. We've been through so much and we've been through so much in the last year, let alone the last four years, let alone the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. 
how salient to you, and I guess I'm asking you the historian in you, mm -hmm. how salient to you is the, the formulation um, post 9-11 America? Mm. Yeah, that's actually a great question. So I am actually trying to think about a post-1979 America, <laughs> or like how do we shift away from this kind of US-centric periodization? So obviously my first film, the film that you mentioned, um, is actually a story about how 9-11 was not a turning point so much as an amplification of a lot of things that already existed. That's why I brought up Oklahoma City, is that we know that 9-11 you know, was not this giant seat, you know, giant shift. It was simply kind of ramping up carceral policies, policing, surveillance, and criminalization of minority populations in ways that already were there. Right. right. Well, one of the things worth remembering here is, is the front page story, um, there were two main ones that were displaced by 9-11. One was mad cow disease, but the other was police violence. And, and yes. Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, New York City, it, 2000, the fall of 2001 was going to be a flashpoint for police violence as a political issue, and it just totally disappeared. Yeah, well, 20 years later, that is the issue. And I think one thing, the one um, encouraging thing, if I want to leave us on an encouraging note, is that this is the first year, you know, as I mentioned I was working with PRI, this is the first year that Americans... Um, a majority of Americans no longer think that Islam is fundamentally at odds with an American way of life. And that's not because the needle has moved with Republicans at all, but enough of the needle has moved uh, for people who identify as Democrats or undecided. Um, and, 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 and we have to remember that that right after 9-11, the majority, I mean, the majority of New Yorkers were okay with Muslims or Arabs being, you know, put in camps or other kinds. There was all kinds of crazy policies that were being floated. So, I mean, that the 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 opt my my feeling about it right now is that um, the the way to counter whatever gets called Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism is in exactly what you're talking about the kind of abolitionist politics the 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 the, the, cr the critique and scrutiny of the security state of police violence because that's that is you know in the same way that the Cold War is the prehistory of 9/11 the the history of police of of the if we can call it, they the, talk about the militarization of the police, but it's really the way the police become militias in this country. That's the other, you know, that's the domestic story of, of, of before 9-11. Um, so I would say it's, I wouldn't say pre, pre, pre post 9-11 and pre, pre 9-11 are the right frames, but there are definitely, that is a window and a touch point and place to go and, and to explore further. So yeah. thanks, Matt. This really is cool. great. Thank you so much. Thank also, you. Thank uh, you. This went um, super fast. It did. It did. Um, <laughs> always such a pleasure thinking alongside you and learning from you. And thanks to all of the, the 60 participants who we can't see. Oh my gosh. We know yes. You're there. Um, please, uh, Keep your eye out for our winter and spring calendar. We look forward to seeing you again. Have great holidays, stay safe, wash your hands, don't touch your face, wear a mask, um, and really don't let your guard down. There's vaccine on the way, but don't let your guard down. Mm -hmm. um, good night, everybody. Thanks so good much. Good night, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.